I'm Rowan McKenzie, a PhD researcher at the Shakespeare Institute and founder of Shakespeare Unbarred, which uses Shakespeare with marginalised communities and individuals, so people with mental health issues, people with learning disabilities, uh, people within the criminal justice system, uh, people who have experienced homelessness and, and other areas of, of marginalisation within uh, the world that we live in today. So I got the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of my work. Um, so in terms of my research and also uh, how Shakespeare and Bard works and what, why are we going with it. Uh, so I hope you find it of interest. Um, for me, my research and, and my PhD thesis, which is due in uh, at the end of this year, is around creating space for Shakespeare in non-traditional settings. So using Shakespeare um, and looking at the theoretical frameworks of, of French spatial theory and how uh, spaces are altered and amended um, and changed by the, the activities that go on within them. So how a room in a theatre um, can be a rehearsal room, but also how a prison library can be a rehearsal room, how a, a room in a university building can be a rehearsal room, and how actually all of those things have become less important and are changed and, and altered, not just during well, the time that activity goes on, but on an ongoing basis now it changes people's perceptions and how Shakespeare can be used to, to bring to life the heterotopic opportunities of theatre and to often give voice to those people who may be marginalised by society for a whole raft of different reasons and previously maybe couldn't find their own voices, but how Shakespeare can give them a way of being heard in a way that society deems acceptable, um, but also in a way that society stops and takes notice. And for me, that's really important. And also giving people the ability to, to build their own self-confidence, to overcome a lot of the traumas that maybe they've experienced, to be able to find that way of articulating their inner thoughts and feelings, and to build emotional resilience. Um, and as I say, to give them a, a, a future that, that looks at the opportunities that they may have. Um, in the course of my research, I've been really fortunate and I've got to work with some amazing companies. Um, so I've worked with Flute Theatre, both in the UK and also spent some time in Barcelona a few years ago. So working with Kelly Hunter and her talented actors with uh, marginalised audiences, people with learning disabilities on the autism spectrum. Um, I'm Shakespeare consultant for Blue Apple Theatre down in Winchester who are entirely learning disabled uh, theatre company and do some fabulous productions. So worked with them closely last year on their version of The Tempest. Um, worked with uh, organisations that have worked with people with mental health issues. So uh, companies like Out of Character up in York um, and also working a lot with uh, psychology services in various prisons to really help to use Shakespeare to, to help people with mental health problems. Um, but one of my big passions is working directly as a theatre practitioner in prisons in England. Um, so that's where Shakespeare and Bard was founded from. Um, and I have the privilege of working in a number of, of UK prisons. So three at the moment, um, but that looks like it might be growing as we go forward and once we come through the COVID crisis. Um, and I certainly hope that it does because it, it brings to life some amazing uh, changes for people. So my first uh, long-term uh, prison engagement was in HMP and Gartry down in Leicestershire um, where I got the opportunity to go in and to set up a fairly short-term project that the National Research Council approved looking at whether or not we could put on a really shortened production of Macbeth, so 30-40 minutes in length. Um, that went so well that in October 2018 the Governor stood up at the end uh, when we received our stand innovation, um, not of the time frame that, that Michael uh, talks about in his video, we didn't have uh, 18 minutes I'm afraid, but we did have everybody on their feet um, and applauding them. Um, so the governor stood up and said, right, this project has come to an end. Um, there was this horrible sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I, I think the, the actors felt the same. Um, and she said, and we now have a drama group as part of our normal regime. So from that, the guys spoke to me about, well, can we create a theatre company? Um, so that's exactly what we did. So it's a completely collaboratively owned theatre company, um, owned equally between myself um, and 15 other people. Um, the difference is they're serving life sentences. Um, however, each of us has an equal voice and each of us has an equal um, opinion. So we work together. So there's um, 14 men and one transgender lady in the group um, and myself. And we work together to choose plays, adapt, adapt them, edit them, rehearse them, and then put on performances. So during our two and a half years together so far, we've worked on Macbeth, uh, we delivered Julius Caesar, which was really interesting, um, trying to work on, on how to get your actors to riot in a prison, 
not something I ever thought I'd do. Um, and neither running around wearing a toga um, fashioned out of a prison bed sheet. But I can say I've done it. Um, and then we went on. So they chose uh, The Merchant of Venice as their third production. And I'd kind of challenged back and said, come on a minute, guys. Religious unrest and, and, and you know, um, is it something we want to tackle in prison? And their response was, yeah, absolutely, because it's not about Shylock being a Jew for us. It's about Shylock being shunned by society. So actually, our Shylock wasn't um, a Jew. He was an individual who'd been released having a life sentence um, and talking about how actually society judged him for that. So the issue between him and Antonio came about from uh, some previous uh, criminal behaviour that had happened before he went to prison. Um, Jessica hated him not because... Um, of any other reason than the fact he wasn't there when she was growing up. Um, and it really helped them to tackle the way that society judges them for their convictions and continues to judge them, and also the difficulties of being separated from their children, for example. Um, and our scriptwriter, who's incredibly talented, um, did say in an interview that was in our programme that this really was a love letter to his children. Um, and I'd like to share with you just a, a short excerpt from the, the prologue of our play, which opened with Shylock stood there, holding his bag of belongings um, at the door of the prison, being released. So we had two officers who were actually releasing him and telling him that's it. His sentence was, he'd served his, his custodial sentence. He was being released now on a, a long-term life sentence. Um, and he stood there and spoke these words to the audience. I think they're really powerful. Too many years have passed me by. Too many losses made me wonder why. To reflect on my actions and their cost. Photos on a wall, reminders of all I'd lost. The price to pay far too high, yet I pay only the least part of it. Those left outside take the biggest hit, they suffer the most and they pay the real cost. Children's tears as they sit on visits, each one a sad memory elicits. Scarring my heart and searing my soul, a souvenir of my part in the sorrow that I've caused and a painful reminder to be a better man, a better dad. A new start... I doubt it. The baggage I carry sits heavy on my shoulders, an invisible label, more apparent as I get older, becoming seen by all and set apart. I'm now an ex-con, a man with no future, simply abandoned by the institutions that place this lodestone around my neck. But for the sake of redemption, I must. I must resist the temptation to seek revenge or to walk the same path I once did. Instead, I need to bask in the love that a child bears for their father, Try harder, do better, go farther than those who go furthest to prove that I deserve such a love. I must move forward no matter what the load, no matter what burden is laid or title bestowed, I shall begin anew. And with this we invited our audience to understand the world from Shylock's perspective, to understand how it feels to be shunned. Um, and I think it really brought things to life. Um, and I think through using Shakespeare it gives people an opportunity to draw on that cultural capital, to draw on those famous speeches. And, and we adapted, for example, Shylock's famous speech about, you know, if you prick me, do I not bleed? Um, and stood there talking about that, that actually we still have more similarities than differences as human beings. Um, we've, we've had a, a similar experience in um, H&P Stafford, where I started in uh, February 2019 and where uh, Emergency Shakespeare was founded. So that's a different dynamic altogether. It's a different group of people serving very different sentence lengths. Um, but again, we've created a community where everybody's voice is heard. Everybody has the opportunity to bring Shakespeare to life. And in that particular um, company, we uh, performed our first production of Macbeth, but brought right up to date into a modern theatre company where, unfortunately, um, the actor was trying to... Um, make the lead actor ill so he could take over from understudy and step up into the main role. Got the um, uh, proportions wrong of this poison that he poured in his drink and killed him off. So our Macbeth actually started quite unwillingly. He didn't mean to kill someone. Um, but we really saw that come to life and it was great to have the governor, who's a huge advocate, and actually contacted me to, to start the theatre company there, um, playing a cameo role and to have officers involved and, and really to, to start to build some, some amazing bridges um, and again to challenge people's perceptions and to have people talk about how their families were proud of them, often for the first time since they were incarcerated or since they'd been arrested for whatever uh, index offence they'd committed. So... For me, Shakespeare gives people that opportunity to bring things to life. Um, and in both of those prisons, um, and also in H&P Wakefield, where I now work, we're raring to go as soon as we can get back in. 
Um, so in um, the Gallowfield Players, we'll soon be working on Sycorax's Storm, which is the story before the Tempest. So it's what happened before that sea storm that we all know and, and love. Um, in uh, Emergency Shakespeare in Stafford, we'll be working on uh, Othello. So we just finished The Merry Wives of Windsor there and we, we're moving on to looking at Othello um, and issues of, of prejudice and, and racial uh, hatred and so on. Um, and it's just a way of, of giving people an opportunity to have a voice. Um, and I think on that basis, I'd really like to just finish off with some words from one of the actors um, in the Gallowfield Players who talks about experiencing freedom within the high security estate. Um, in a recent conversation, I was asked, why would I want to attend a prison drama group? Was it not embarrassing to stand up on stage and perform in front of people? I could only answer each part of this inquiry in turn. And firstly, unless you ever attend the group, it's difficult, perhaps even impossible, to grasp the depth of feeling that's attached to it by all involved. For a few short hours every week, we are free. Although physically we remain within the boundaries of the prison, our spirits soar far above the walls and fences. Our minds are so involved in what we do that we could be in any room, on any stage, anywhere in the world. This is a true sense of freedom, and one that's rarely found anywhere in life, let alone within the high security estate. It offers each of us a few brief moments of nirvana. The weekly group provides a safe and supportive space in which we can express ourselves. It is a space in which honesty exists and the truth is not used as a weapon to beat us down, but instead to empower, to encourage each and every one of us involved. We get the opportunity to be occasionally irreverent without the fear of institutional retribution and our combined coping mechanism of gallows humour is appreciated as humour, not of some manifestation of criminal deviancy. Our weekly sessions allow us to have an opinion and a voice so that it can be heard. Not all of our ideas are achievable, but in the group they're considered, and this alone helps build confidence and raise self-esteem. We are treated as equals, as people, and this is often an alien concept within the penal system. Upon crossing the threshold of prison, we instantly become less. We are stripped of our clothes, stripped of our dignity, stripped of our humanity. Our lives prior to incarceration instantly rendered worthless. All of our experience, our knowledge debased. However, within the setting of the Gallowfield players, these trends are reversed. Prison standards turned on their head. The group is a cooperative endeavour. This means that all involved have a sense of ownership of it. At times, a possessiveness over this beautiful organism that grows in unexpected and wondrous ways. It means there is a sense of responsibility bestowed on everyone to act in a certain manner, to be the best us that we can be in order to reap the rewards this initiative has to offer. And with the ownership and responsibility comes anxiety and self-doubt because it's valued so highly. The pain of doing anything that would let others down is a side effect of the benefits of the ownership and the camaraderie that we feel. It's a small price to pay. As for the second part of the question, in prison are we not all actors playing the part we need to depending on the setting we are in? Offender management unit and psychology expect one set of behaviours. Survival on the wing requires another. Our families another. Workshops and education still a different set. And many cannot be themselves, or they lose themselves in the tangled web that the penal system weaves. For some, an escapism from the mind-numbing reality of prison life is in the characters played, and even if there's embarrassment of standing in front of your peers and acting, a small moment or two of discomfort's nothing when compared to the hours and hours of pleasure experienced. All I can say is this is the closest thing to freedom I've experienced in prison without being in the arms of my loved ones. I think it's really important to, to hear the words um, spoken by some of the actors um, and it's for that reason that um, whilst we're out um, during the Covid uh, crisis I've been working really hard to send in activities for the actors and to get them engaged so we're rehearsing remotely if that's possible. Um, they're behind their cell doors at the moment unfortunately to, to make sure that we can keep um, the pandemic under some form of control in the prison system and it's really challenging to be separated from them. Um, on such a, a long going basis. But one of the things we have been doing, say, is creating these activities um, that we can all do together and that we can share. And we've even managed to, to edit a whole script while we've been separated. Um, but we've also been producing packs um, so collaboratively. I've done a lot of the work, but we've had illustrations produced by, by uh, some of the actors. Um, and we've also had activities suggested by them and some reflections on the plays. Um, and those packs are going back into every prison in England. 
Wales and Scotland um, and making things available for people to use their creativity and we're, we're pitching them at three different levels so we've got pack one which is aimed at those who maybe English isn't their first language or maybe literacy is an issue a lot of the, the responses are creative and um, we've got the middle pack so pack two which is looking at maybe people who can read a newspaper without any trouble um, and they're maybe starting to do some written um, explorations of, of uh, the stories and narratives of Shakespeare um, and then pack three for those people who maybe are more engaged with Shakespeare or want to be more engaged and actually want something a little bit more intellectually challenging so there we're using the the play but we're then taking maybe some speeches some scenes out of that and actually getting them to write back to it or to translate into modern English things that hopefully whilst they're behind their doors and they're physically confined more than they've ever been they're in a position where they can mentally free themselves and I think for me that's what Shakespeare gives um, it gives people the opportunity to say whilst my physical restrictions and um, my physical incarceration whether that be actual um, literal incarceration or whether that be mentally because of my mental health challenges or because of learning disabilities or because of, of the fact that I'm ostracized by society Shakespeare gives me a way to find my voice to build my resilience and to be the person that deep down inside I know that I can be. And I'm hoping that that's what Shakespeare and Bard brings to the, the men and women that I work with and that will continue to do so. Thank you very much.